found online. All right. It is going to be page two. The title is A Lower Types of Cranks, Crooks, and Racial Bigots, The Universal Negro Improvement Association and Black Political Violence in the United States, 1918-1930. Just to break down the title, the article is talking about how uh, infighting in the UNIA, ACL, Marcus Garvey's government, and Royal Society, how the how there was a breakdown and how the infighting played out. Uh, So this article, I think is important to inform how to reorganize uh, the movement, something we're doing in Uganda and Nigeria. Some of us working with the chiefdoms over there to try to build chiefdoms in the diaspora. It's not for everybody to avoid infighting, but it's a strategy for members to get power in autonomous communities and to grow their own movements. Uh, so this article basically goes over a lot of what was, you know, diaspora, tribal wars. You know, we see it on social media a lot. The ethnic differences, the political differences, as far as which governments people want to identify with. Uh, so it is, uh, it's still relevant 100, what, 100 years later. So... 100 plus years later so this is uh this is gonna be page two page one i, I made a lot of comments the abstract i think it took eight minutes but i'm gonna try and get through this i think on uh, page 14 it just becomes footnotes so i'm gonna try and get through all of this as soon as possible i think it's an important article so this is page two <clears throat> in february 1923 the Washington Post published a story alleging that Chandler Owen, the African-American socialist leader, had been the target of an attempted attack in Pittsburgh by supporters of the UNIA. The UNIA supporters were said to have rushed a streetcar in which Chandler Owen was riding and failed to harm him, only through timely interference of the police. In the decade or so after World War I, there were numerous reports of incidents of violence involving supporters of the UNIA, the Black Nationalist Organization founded and led by the charismatic and controversial African-Jamaican activist Marcus Garvey. What these episodes can tell us about the UNIA, about the wider dynamics of Black activism in the interwar period has not, however, been extensively discussed by historians. So just to cover that paragraph, they said there was fighting or there was attempted attacks uh, by, uh, you never know who, you know what's behind this. It was homegrown uh, people. Oh, you never know. It could have been infiltration, but it shows a lack of discipline uh, in fighting. But, you know, me being from uh, the whole Biafra, Nigeria region, it's, uh, and uh, growing up in organizations attached to governments, uh, yeah, something that I tried to avoid and try to uh, take some of it, leave some of it out, you know, but, um, uh, just trying to speed through this. That was one paragraph. All right. Second paragraph begins analyses of interwar black activism have traditionally tended to focus on the rivalries, successes, and failures of the prominent leaders of the time, figures such as Garvey, W. Du Bois, Cyril Briggs, Chandler Owen, and A. Philip Randolph, to name but a few. The slant in the historiography reflects the relatively limited sources available for studying grassroots black activism before World War II. One area of black resistance studies that has undergone a particularly notable recent revamp is that of violence and self-defense. The vast majority of this literature has focused on the post-World War period, but the significance of armed self-defense by African Americans during Reconstruction has also received attention, inter, interracial and 
black intra-racial violence in the post-war period, however, remains re- relatively understudied. Given that the UNIA members were apparently involved in various instances of politically motivated confrontations with the supporters of other black organizations, the UNIA's activism offers insights into the circumstances under which such tension could re- occur, and as well as some of the factors that could both exacerbate and allay such tensions. Uh, just so, so yeah, this is uh, that uh, that paragraph is talking about. They're going to be studying war, uh, basically violence between black people and other races and between organizations during the uh, the Great European War or World War One, I, I guess. That's what this article is saying they're going to be reviewing. Uh, but I'd like to say, you know, <clears throat> when you talk about, you know, if you study African civil, any civilization really, groups, groups, you know, they take over, they... People start off as groups, they get land, they get some marriage laws, they get rules and rituals about them, they get some land, they become a civilization, if they don't get land, you know, you know it's like uh, there's a saying, difference between a gang and a nation is uh, laws, or something. <laughs> laws or marriage, like used to, it's basically saying you tweak a couple things, you know, a nation can... It looks very similar to what people call a gang or an army. So it's it's like a marriage marriage ritual here, a name change there, and uh, some land here. People become a nation. So it's it's a thin line between when you approach a nationhood. You know, it's a very you gotta be very careful, or you're gonna get infiltrated, sabotaged, uh, criminalized. <clears throat> so. It's a very thin line. You got to be, well, it's a, it's something I took account of and uh, something that I'm aware of. You got to be careful you know, and exact, precise. Otherwise, you're going to blow up the whole, you know, chemistry set. <laughs> so, uh, so let me see. So I'm going to read the next paragraph. Established by Garvey in Jamaica in 1914. The UNIA was founded on a commitment to economic and social uplift for the African diaspora, as well as racial separatism, anti-miscegenation, and self-defense. Garvey's African fundamentalism emphasized the racial distinctiveness of people of African descent, their historical achievements, and the importance of economic development and transnational self-determination for the race. Famously, it championed the development of an independent black state in Africa and the subsequent repatriation of black Americans to Africa. However, it has been argued by several historians that the UNIA's repatriation agenda was of symbolic yet secondary importance to many grassroots UNIA supporters in the U.S. who are more interested in what the organization could offer in terms of social activism and community solidarity. And in the UNIA's attempt to establish black-owned businesses and cooperatives, including the organization's shipping enterprises, the Black Star Line Steamship Corporation, and the Black Cross Navigation and Trading Company. Such a focus on black economic independence and uplift was a central aspect of Garvey's ism's ability to present a viable program and community for black people away from the oversight and control of whites. This idea of economic separatism appealed to both urban and rural Garveyites and was a central tenant of the UNIA's appeal. As a further explanation for its widespread success, UNIA philosophy managed to successfully intersect with African-American religious preferences, meaning that Garveyism could powerfully combine religious and civic values, creating a potent vision of redemption. The UNIA established local divisions or branches all over the world by the early 1920s, including Europe, Africa, Canada, and the Caribbean. Garvey was based at 
You and I had quarters in Harlem, New York, between 1918 and 1927, and the organization experienced its most rapid expansion in the U.S. The years of UNI's greatest grassroots strikes in the U.S. was the period between 1918 and 1930, and these dates provide the temporal parameters for this study. So basically it's saying the study is going to be between 1918 and 1930. There are global divisions. They combine uh, religious and citizenship values within the organization, a sense of government, sense of citizenship and religion within the UNIACL. Uh, like I say, it was like a Royal African society, a theocracy. It was, I compare it personally to, you know, uh, the Congo Empire. <clears throat> if you guys know that was a Christian, Central, West African, or let's say Central African, because it's, it's uh, you know, the DRC is Central Africa, East Africa. Uh, but the Congo Empire, actually, the Congo Empire, yeah, that was like a West African, Central African thing. So it's like that, that Christian Empire idea merging. African symbols with the Bible uh, or black African symbols with the Bible. Uh, Garvey movement was trying to do that. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was interesting. Uh, syncretic, syncretism. It was mixed. In like, there was pictures of snakes and pharaohs, which are the old priest kings. Then you have symbols and talks of Christianity. So it was mixing indigenous animism ideas and military ideas and religious ideas it resembled to me the Congo Empire uh, and you know how that 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 fell apart from infighting too but uh <clears throat> let's see there's also it's talking about how the economics now we're talking about the sense of community the economic separatism so that's what we have in Igbo land, or as we call it, Obi Africa. It's like the Vatican of Africa. We have the most autonomous communities there. So it was, you could call the the Autonomous Communities League. That's what they're trying to build, you know, like sister communities, sister cities, sister neighborhoods. You know, that they're trying to build like mirror communities across the world that were autonomous, self-governing, self-regulating, independent economically. So, you know, a business league type of model where the people run everything themselves, sleeping with a book of tea in this National Negro Business League. So that was probably an inspiration for this. Uh, you know, he, he came to USA to meet with Booker T and employ the Tuskegee model. But it's, it's basically saying that this uh, was an attempt to build autonomous chiefdoms a league of autonomous communities, chiefdoms, if we call it that, across the USA and across the world, and f just a form of federation of autonomous communities. And back then there was still segregation, so there are much larger black communities and sections of cities <clears throat> and businesses to draw from where they just probably needed some cultural dialogue to know how things work, titles worked, education system worked so it's just you gotta use your imagination that there was a segregation made it look more possible to build these african chiefdoms across the usa in urban centers and rural centers there's more land owned for building these rural communities that were connected to africa so basically i say acl should stand for autonomous communities league so that's what they were really trying to build. Uh, so just to finish off this page, in the aftermath of World War One, the UNIA capitalized on nationwide climate of anti-black violence in the USA to spread a message of resistance and group solidarity for the African diaspora. The UNIA's relationship with self-defense and violence in general was, however, to lead many onlookers in both the black and white communities to view the organization with a deep sense of unease. <laughs> According to some of Marcus Garvey's most prominent rivals in the black American community, the involvement of UNIM members in instances of political violence was proof that the UNI attracted 
lower types of cranks, crooks, and racial bigots among whom suggestibility to violent crime is much greater. Uh, I got a comment on that. That so basically, it's saying that uh, the UNIACL was originally associated with violent acts, and that these uh, <laughs> basically they're saying that they were thugged out. So you know, if people know how the UNIA became the Black Panther movement and. That broke down into the gangs and through the infiltration and having the set numbers and division numbers. It's all kind of related to infiltration and basically not having vetting systems, not having strong vetting systems. Uh, yeah, but the USA is like these. Uh, you know, they all they always say the USA. You know, started off as criminals from Britain and they wiped. They did genocide. And slavery to chattel slavery, where people treated like livestock animals. So they did their own crimes. So now this upstart group, this upstart organization, this upstart religion, this upstart government, the UNIACL, was going to be painted as the the real criminals <laughs> for them to try to uprise. That if whatever violence was there, it was nothing to compare to what it took to build America. So. Uh, yes, it's always that dichotomy. I'm reading this just to pour light on the situation. That is, uh, you gotta be careful in organizing, or how I avoided some of the pitfalls so far, uh, and why I organize the way I do. But yeah, I'm aware that this article. I didn't write the article. I'm just saying that there's some good parts in it. I don't agree with everything that's said here, word for word, but. That's why I'm trying to take extra time to break down some parts and not just reading it word for word straight through. But uh, so we we pick up from they talk about uh, how they were recruiting from violent people. But it says this contemporary view of the criminal nature of some sections of UNIA supporters has been perpetuated since, including by historians, Judith Stein, for example has blamed the aggressive oratory of UNI leaders for making respectable members of the working class more in inclined towards violence uh, than they would otherwise have been. Such a view, however, does not allow for an analysis of why Garveyites as individuals or groups may have chosen or felt compelled to behave aggressively or how Issues such as class, ethnicity, or gender may have impacted upon behavior. Um, using the thematic lens of violence, this study offers a re-examination of the relationships between the famous war of words among the prominent black leaders of the interwar period and actions of their supporters. Types of violence under consideration in the study are violence between UNI supporters and the supporters of other black activist groups uh, between rival factions within the American UNI itself. These t particular type of violence will be referred to as political violence, which for the purposes of this study doesn't include instances of interracial violence against whites or other racial groups, as the study seeks to better conceptualize the inter uh, conceptualized relationship between the war of words at leadership level and the action of supporters on the ground the study uses terms such as supporters and grassroots to mean those people who are not part of the UNIA's national level leadership hierarchy. Although perhaps someone argue somewhat vague, this terminology is used here partly because the recognized challenges associated with applying generalized social class labels to UNIA support base. Evidence from a number of sources suggests that it was UNIA supporters who were most often involved in political tensions and violence against supporters of other black organizations. This is why the study takes UNIA as its main entry point for discussing black political violence in this period. Covering confrontations between UNIA supporters and the supporters of other black organizations. 
as well as examples of violence between different factions within the American UNI itself. The study aims to provide insights into dynamics of interwar black political rivalry generally and of UNIA activism especially. The study argues that ethnic differences within the American UNIA became significant in some prominent cases of violence between competing factions inside the organization. Evidence is less conclusive about the impact of ethnic differences in the tensions between UNIA members and the supporters of other black organizations. Such confrontations were less likely to end in genuine violence can be seen as extensions of the war of words at leadership level. At times, tensions were exacerbated by the presence of black leaders in certain major cities and the subsequent mobilizing of their respective followers against each other. All right. It's also possible to speculate that the presence and actions of law enforcement, U.S. government officers, during some of the incidents indicate that the state benefited from the UNIA being seen to be involved in political violence, especially as the white American press was inclined to report the involvement of law enforcement officers in both uncovering and thwarting UNIA activities. <clears throat> so basically that the paragraphs about how the U.S. government uh, exploited the differences uh, but and um, the aggressiveness of the membership of the UNIA, how they exploited <laughs> they exploited the differences and outsmarted them. Uh, and it's important to note where you failed in order to make changes. Uh, yep, you got to make changes. The study seeks to make links between symbolic violence, the words, writings, and rhetoric rhetorical threats that were traded between Marcus Garvey and several of his main rivals and physical violence, suggesting that at times physical violence could be the extension of the symbolic confrontation of the leader's war of words, but also that symbolic violence could be the limit of the confrontation between the UNI and other black organizations. Examples of tension between the grassroots supporters of different black activist groups encourage us to acknowledge how deeply contested interwar black activism really was both in the South and in the North, rather than looking for continuities or similarities across black protest movements, a deeper understanding that the complex of the complex and often intense rivalries of the interwar period should encourage us to ask questions about the interactions between the different visions for activism that competed at grassroots as well as at leadership level. With hindsight, it has become clear that organizational black nationalism, black socialism, and communism did not stand the test of time uh, as successfully as did, for example, the NAACP, (laughs) National Association for Advancement of Colored People. However, this shouldn't draw us into assuming that those forms of protest did not survive or survived only sporadically, were somehow less authentic or meaningful options for African Americans after World War I and into the 1920s. For example, the intensity of the rhetorical attacks directed at the UNIA by other black leaders and groups is likely indicative of the threat that the UNIA's success posed to organizations like the NAACP, which itself struggled at grassroots levels (laughs) in the 1920s. Uh, (laughs) So that that, uh, paragraph is basically talking about uh, the UNIA's uh, war of words and how it might be connected to physical fighting or worse, Uh, So I'm trying to speed through this a little bit more. Although black intellectuals and leaders in the 1920s tended to talk of racial unity, the competition to win and retain support bases was fierce. And the confrontations of the periods are indicative of the significance, significant significance of themes such as personality, loyalty and rivalry in understanding such confrontations. So that, that was page three and uh, those two pages took 24 minutes, basically, to get through. I'm going to end it here. <clears throat>